Hello folks and welcome back. Uh, in this lecture we will be talking about this article called Writing in Global Context Composing Usable Text for Audiences from Different Cultures by one Kirk St. Amant. And this is a very important topic. It's uh, a topic that we cover quite a bit in my uh, business communication classes as well uh, because, you know, as we'll get into here, but as you probably know, uh, you know, uh, international communications is a huge thing. Uh, whether you're talking about social media or some type of uh, professional communication job, uh, websites, you might be managing, working with people from uh, many different cultures. You know, even in my, uh, when I went to get my latest eye exam, uh, for example, uh, it wasn't just working with the one optometrist like in the old days. <laughs> <laughs> I think there were maybe three different people involved in this, uh, you know, sort of routine uh, eye exam. The technician, I guess, uh, whatever that person was called there at the Sam's Club, who, by the way, is the St. Cloud State alumni. But anyway, uh, then he, uh, part of it was uh, done over what looked kind of like Zoom or Skype. Uh, there was a doctor there. Not sure where that doctor was located. And then there was another a doctor towards the end of the uh, appointment from a different place. It may, might have been, you know, if the accents were anything to go by, maybe two different countries, and then the third, uh, if you count, uh, you know, the United States here at the, at the local Sam's Club. Uh, so even in something, you know, I wouldn't have expected that. You know, just going in for a routine eye exam, uh, for that to be a sort of global context uh, with all these different audiences and different cultures involved, but... Uh, there you go. You know, and if it's happening there, you can rest assured it would probably be happening in almost any industry, any business you, know, you want to think about. Uh, so the information here is very, very important. Uh, these are great questions uh, to be thinking about that St. Amat Kirk <laughs> uh, poses in this chapter. So uh, anyway, we'll get into this. I will add a couple things. Uh, you know, this is such an important topic. I think you need more Hopefully you've, you've had some other classes that have, have addressed these topics, but if you haven't, uh, you can certainly sign up for uh, any intercultural communications classes and communication studies. Uh, you can also take uh, Rhetoric for Diverse Audiences, and that's a class that will be offered for the first time uh, next year, or whenever you're watching this uh, video, just look for it in the Amongst the English Offerings. I forget the number. I think it's like 430. Uh, but anyway, uh, you need you probably need a full semester to be studying these topics. Okay, so let's get into the uh, chapter here. You know, by the way, I hope you're you're finding these articles a little bit or these chapters a little bit more readable, uh, usable uh, than some of the previous ones. I mean, these are definitely, to my mind, uh, you know, I read these quickly. Uh, these are uh, easy to comprehend, and I feel like it's stuff I can just pick up and, and use right away. You know, so it's one of the things I <laughs> I love in an article, uh, whether it's academic or, or uh, pedagogical like this one. <clears throat> you know, but do let me know. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, if you read something that doesn't make any sense to you, uh, you're not sure what something means, maybe there's a reference to something you're not familiar with, you can always ask me. I always make a point at the end of these lectures to put that Q, uh, Q and A section there. That's exactly for that reason. I don't expect anybody to know 100% of the things that I'm paid to teach you, right? Uh, so don't be afraid to ask questions. All right. So they, uh, he starts off here talking about uh, the international spread of online access, interconnected world. I would say this. I'd be curious to, uh, to know what you think about this, but I speculate that with COVID and all of this emphasis on remote, doing things remotely, staying at home, uh, the Zooming, the Skyping, the Teams, uh, you know, you name it. Uh, I think this is, you know, I think that has basically helped to uh, expedite processes that were already sort of creeping along. Because uh, the fact is, it's just a lot of situations where it does make more sense just to, you know, Zoom or Skype from home than it would be to actually go someplace, go to a business uh, in the local area even <laughs> sometimes you know i catch myself ordering uh delivery or something when i could just very easily go to the store but for some reason it just seems easier i'm like why should i even bother you know going to the grocery store when i could just have the stuff uh delivered for a few extra bucks uh, so anyway i think that this we've established precedence now that will be uh, even after you know 
if, if everything goes uh, amazingly well, <laughs> you know, and, and there's uh, totally, uh, you know, everything's totally back to normal, quote unquote, uh, I still think there'll be a sizable, you know, uh, increase in the amount of these, uh, what he's talking about here, this in, an interconnected world, you know, maybe the, uh, you might be interacting with somebody from uh, South Korea one day, or maybe within the same day, you know, South Korea, Australia, India, uh, you know, Germany, uh, Ireland, uh, you know, just a lot of different countries, countries and cultures will be involved in almost, yeah, uh, every aspect of life, look what he's got here, uh, from business, which is what I can concerned about, but also uh, social and political discussions, even entertainment uh, and leisure activities. Uh, so it's pretty awesome uh, to think about this. Uh, but, of course, it also is challenging <laughs> when you're trying to be a good rhetorician. And I uh, remember part of this class and part of uh, my professional communication, uh, you know, part of that prof professional communication program is about is not just you learning this stuff, but being able to tell others about it, you know, when you show up at a job and maybe you might be hired on at a, at a place just because they expect you to have this cultural knowledge, uh, you know, the globalized rhetoric you know, and be able to help them. <laughs> this would be a great reason to hire uh, somebody fresh out of college because you would hope they would be up to date on precisely this kind of information. Uh, okay, so Kirk uh, St. Amat uh, talks about the globalized, he calls it a globalized rhetoric approach. And I, I just uh, cut to the chase here. I think that the main idea <laughs> is that when you're talking about rhetoric, you can't be thinking about a one size fits all approach and uh, you know i work with a lot of students as you can imagine and almost all of them come to me with this one size fits all you know where's the template i just want to fill in the template where's the form kind of mentality and they're not uh recognizing that, that, that that's just not going to work <laughs> uh, we'll get into some examples here in a minute but uh, if you're talking about a resume a business letter an essay you know all these even uh, those fairly standard uh, uh, types of documents, they look very different in other uh, cultures and uh, different uh, demographics. You know, again, we'll, we'll get into some of this, but uh, to the extent that you can understand that you will need to adapt, that there's not one model that's always going to work, and you really need to, instead of seeing these uh, differences in cultures or, you know, different communication systems as one being better than the other, or this is the right way, my way is the right way, if you can get away from that kind of thinking, uh, and think about, uh, you know, context and uh, the different expectations that, that people have, uh, you'll be, <laughs> you know, you'll already be, you know, much further along, shall we say, uh, than many of your uh, fellow students. Uh, so uh, kudos to you. Uh, okay, the culture of the audience for which you are writing, uh, the genre you are writing in when, the genre you are writing in when sharing information with that cultural audience. Uh, so let's look at an example of this to kind of get us started here. Let's see if I can get this pulled up. Uh, not that one. <laughs> yes, yes, so there we go. Uh, resumes. Uh, so he, so Yama talks about these different genres, and I would, uh, I'm sure, I like to use this example because most people are familiar with it. Uh, the resume that you'll write when you're out on the job market looking for a job. And a lot of people think, that this is just the same, you know, even though you might be applying for something, you know, especially, uh, you know, again, in this age of uh, doing things remotely, it's quite possible that, you know, even if you live here in St. Cloud or in, in Minnesota, even, maybe you have a job that's in, in a Europe, may, may, maybe you're applying for jobs in Europe, uh, and, you, you know, being a resume, uh, being part of that process, you know, maybe this is a remote job, but, uh, you know, you still, <laughs> still need to submit a a resume. So it's really interesting. Again, you think that would you, you think a resume would look the same in, in every country? Uh, but I just did a quick little Google search. Nothing, you know, elaborate here. Just went. I think I looked for resume formats in different countries, and boom. And there's all these examples here. This is a European countries. I actually found this really interesting. Uh, I guess because I'm just because <laughs> it's part of my. Uh, business communication stuff, but uh, you can see they use something called the Euro EuroPass format, which is a standard template allowing job hunters to describe education skills, blah, blah, blah. 
Uh, besides the standard document, here's the part that I thought was interesting. Many companies also advise job hunters to attach a professional photo. You know, that's something that is, I mean, I've seen many textbooks here say you should not do that. You know, there's actually some issues, even legal issues around this, depending on, of course, the, the job. <laughs> So that's just one quick example. Then they got other things in here for, you know, Singapore, Germany, uh, Australia, uh, China. Let's look at China. When writing a Chinese resume, make sure you do not skip. Why can I not? <laughs> make sure you do not skip on your personal info. Uh, highlight a professional photo. There's that photo again of you on the top right corner. As educational info appears to be an important part of a Chinese resume, place it before your work experiences section. So that's something I would, <laughs> I, you know, strongly advise in my classes. But uh, anyway, we could go on with that. But you know, hopefully you can, you know, get the point there that uh, you couldn't just have this one resume that you send to a Japanese employer and then a Chinese employer, a, a German employer. You would need to be thinking about those differences. And I'm sure there are many more than the ones that were on that little article there. Okay. Uh, now, St. Amit says his approach focuses on something called usability. And we've talked a little bit about this already, usability studies. It's Usually it's done in the context of, say, a, a new app interface. If I want to design, a, uh, let's say I want to design an app for, say, cloud students where they can, oh, uh, pick classes and see what classes are available in the upcoming semesters. Uh, if you did a usability test of that, you would have students come in, you know, your representative group, the target users, they call them. Uh, so you just have some regular students come in and you give them some tax, tasks to do. You know, find uh, the classes available in the English department in the spring semester. You know, you give them tasks like that. Uh, and then you'd be watching and recording uh, the steps they take. You know, so if they're, if they're making lots of bad clicks and going to the wrong place and, you know, they can't find it or they, you know, they come back with the wrong information or they're, or they're confused or it takes them 10 minutes instead of a few seconds, you know, uh, these are things you would note. And then the idea being you'd go back into that software, go back into that interface and see if you can eliminate those, uh, call them bottlenecks, uh, you know, the, whatever those problems are, what, what was making it confusing hopefully find and, and fix those. So that's basically the idea behind usability. But St. Amat uh, wants to apply it to this, uh, you know, basically all writing and all, all these different contexts, all these different cultures, make it a part of this globalized rhetorical uh, uh, thing <laughs> that he's talking about. So here's his definition here, or here's what a globalized rhetoric focuses on. He says three things. One, rhetoric. This is an interesting definition of rhetoric, I thought. Uh, so there's really not, you notice it doesn't have the word persuasive in there, persuasion, uh, nothing like that. It's just how individuals organize information so an audience can use it. So again, like those usability studies, right? Thinking about communication like you're designing an app or a menu uh, or you know, like a resume, uh, you want people to be able to use that. Uh, they want to use it to see if you're qualified <laughs> for the job, right? Uh, if you are a good candidate for an interview. And so they're used, it's got a use value to it, uh, as well as, of course, the, you know, there's always going to be that persuasive factor there. But <clears throat> anyway, obviously, if they can't figure out where your degree is from or <laughs> uh, do you have the skills, uh, because the resume is so badly designed or it's so, um, you know, sort of American focused uh, that a person in another country is kind of struggling with it because it doesn't match up to their expectations about a resume uh, you got a problem all right audience the people who use and read the text in order to perform a task uh, and then genre the formats into which documents are organized for effective use and then he's got all kinds of questions he wants you to ask about this you know the, the global rhetoric what's he called a globalized rhetoric uh, you know, one thing that you should like about this is how easy it is to apply. You know, he actually gives you the questions to ask. I, you know, I always love it when it's not just a sort of deep theory, uh, but it's, you know, here's some real practical things you can do. You, know, you got a document you're working on, a resume uh, that you're going to be sending to India. You know, you could run it through these questions and, and come back with some, you know, tips and some strategies and hopefully some ideas for uh, 
making that document fit the audience better. So all cultures have rhetorical expectations or different things they're looking for. Uh, could be everything from... Here, here, let me just show you something quick here. Coming back to, to this uh, context. This is a... There's a uh, let's see, what's the name of this? Japan External Trade Organization. Uh, so the Japanese government... Uh, has all kinds of information here on their uh, this website, Jetro. And part of it is this guide called Communicating with Japanese in Business. And so this is you know put out by the uh, Japanese government, and it goes through a lot of communication information, situational behavior, uh, formality, uh, unintended tone, ambiguous expressions. I mean, it's very informative and this is probably the sort of thing you would study if you were in a intercultural communication uh, class but you know it's easy enough to find these things and you feel like you can at least I feel like it's fairly <laughs> trustworthy since it is the uh, Japan's own government putting it out uh, so this is the sort of thing you could look at uh, to get some ideas oh, let me get back to my uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, the book, you know, but there's a lot of stuff in there that's not just common sense. Uh, a lot of things that you may be totally unaware of. They're just reading that guide. <laughs> You're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> I'm so glad I read that uh, before I, you know, dove in and you know, it sent that uh, letter off or that email off to my contacts. Uh, you know, the CEO of that company. Yes, uh, don't assume that the strategy you use to present information in your own culture can be used with other cultures. That would be incorrect. All right, so just to hammer that home, go back to this. Uh, I have a little fun quiz here uh, called Test Your Knowledge of Cultural Taboos. So take a few minutes to do that, and then uh, you know think about how you did. I don't care if you made a 10 out of 10 or whatever. You know, it's just for... Uh, you know, entertainment, not entertainment, uh, educational value. <laughs> As I just run through this quiz, see how you do, and then uh, reflect on that. You know, how do you feel about those results, and maybe uh, what does it tell you about these intercultural contexts? Okay, so back to St. Amat. So, first question, who is your audience, and what culture are you writing? So, if you said it was Japan... You know, that's a start. <laughs> you could read that guidebook. <laughs> you know, it's a place to start getting uh, to know this audience. What genre will you use to share information with that cultural audience? So again, the genre could be the resume that we've been talking about. It could be a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, maybe you're doing an advertisement, television commercial. Uh, you can think about a job interview as a genre. Uh, blogging, tweeting. Uh, he talks here about instruction manuals. I thought that was interesting. So some cultures might associate instruction manuals with marketing. Right? So there's kind of a commercialized-like aspect to it. Uh, whereas others would see that as just being a distraction, doesn't belong, and that would even affect the credibility. Uh, three, does the genre actually exist? And is it used in, and is it used in the culture of my audience? So his example of this was... You know, I think pretty much resumes are used everywhere. But he points out that Twitter posts, you know, I didn't know this. Uh, I thought Twitter was pretty much everywhere. But he says, uh, yes, it technically is in Germany, but nobody or hardly anybody uses it. So relatively few Germans, he says, actually uses Twitter. So there's, it's just not a very popular uh, tool to use there. <laughs> so, you know, obviously that would be an important thing to, to know. You know, if you're trying to market things or, uh, you know, do something in, in Germany and you're trying to use Twitter as your sort of default communication tool, you're probably going to fail, uh, utterly fail. <laughs> you did not take uh, that question into, into mind. Uh, question four. Uh, if the genre exists, what purpose does the related culture associate with it? You know, another very good, good question. You know, just because... Uh, you know, maybe this other country does use Twitter, but they're not using it for the same purposes that we do uh, here. Uh, you know, you can think, too, about you know, all these video sharing sites, all these different 
it just goes on and on. <laughs> and I actually think it's really cool to think about people using uh, these tools in ways that were not anticipated by the uh, designers. Uh, let's see what he uses as his example. So certain cultures view the business letter as a mechanism used to display a knowledge of the recipient in order to establish a relationship with that person. So to go back to Kenneth Burke, I don't know if I've, uh, <laughs> that's his kind of model of, of uh, rhetoric is it's about identification, right? Consubstantiality with the audience. My ways are like your ways, or I'm part of your group. You know, that being an important part of uh, business letters. You know, we talk about this and, you know, typically when you're writing a business letter over here, you just kind of get to the point right away. You know, I'm writing to apply for the job, you know, blah, blah, blah. You put your purpose for writing right at the top. Uh, whereas in other cultures, it, that would be considered very rude uh, or it might look uh, crude somehow. You know, you'd, you'd want to uh, say a few things, <clears throat> sort of what we might think of as being, <clears throat> I don't know, uh, uh, friendly or sort of personal uh, stuff at the beginning. You'd kind of warm up uh, <laughs> before you get to the uh, purpose for writing. You know, how's your family and, and that sort of thing. Hope you're having a beautiful day. Uh, those sorts of statements aren't just there for, uh, you know, I mean, they serve a purpose. It's important to have them in there. All right, question five. What kinds of information does a cultural audience expect to encounter in that genre? He's going to go back, I think, here to his... Uh, uh, manual again. Uh, we've talked in here about the. Actually, I might be getting my my classes confused, but I know I've talked about. <laughs> you know, everybody uh, when they look at a resume, they expect to see certain things. You know, where, where's your contact information? Uh, where'd you go to school? What jobs have you worked uh, in, and so on. A text could contain information the reader does not think is essential. All right, so sometimes I see resumes and they're they. They spend a lot of time talking about hobbies and <laughs> things of that sort. And I'm like, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, it's interesting, I suppose. But, you know, is this really something that employer wants to know? And is it going to be something that they, uh, or, or are they going to look at that and say, this doesn't really belong here. This person doesn't seem very familiar with the, uh, you know, how to do a resume. Uh, but again, you know, in another culture, maybe that stuff would be uh, critical. You know, maybe they would say, I don't really get a, good sense of this person's hobbies <laughs> this is a bad resume <laughs> you have to familiarize yourself with that uh you know the expectations of that culture see question six in what order do you need to present information uh, in a genre where in a text should a table of contents this was interesting so i always think the table of contents is at the beginning of the, of the of the book right but he uh says it's not always the case sometimes it's at the end of the text Kind of an important thing to know. Uh, question seven, what visual elements should be included and how? We were talking about the, should a resume have a photo in it? Uh, typically in America, you say no, you don't put a photo on a resume. <laughs> uh, but again, other cultures, it's expected, you know. Let's see, as a result, what constitutes a usable number of images per page for one culture could be considered overwhelming. Uh, for another, cultures can also vary in terms of what constitutes a credible and acceptable vis uh, visual to represent something. Uh, nuances in such uh, situations can be <laughs> complex. <laughs> yeah, isn't that uh, the truth there? There's a lot of, uh, you know, issues we don't really have time to go into here. Uh, but things, if, you, if you've got humans, human models, basically, or you're, you're showing human beings in the photos... Uh, you might want to put some thought, you know, and, and again, coming back to all the questions he, he uh, poses here, uh, again, because it's not a simple thing, and especially what you're having the people do in the photos and so on and so forth. Uh, researching culture and genre expectations. Uh, so how, yeah, so let's say you're doing this again, you, know, you want to write, send the resume, you want to apply for this job in Japan, unless well, a lot of, I get Students all the time, it's like that's their dream is to work in Japan. They really, <laughs> you know, want to achieve that. So uh, I would go over this list with them. You know, let's uh, first, uh, let's see what information we can collect directly from the audience. 
members of the intended cultural audience to get the answers to the questions noted here. Uh, so if you know some people in Japan, uh, some Japanese friends, uh, people that grew up there, uh, people that are employed there even better, uh, you know, anything that you can get directly from the people that are members of that culture, that's going to be far superior than stuff you read online or, you know, you, you talk to somebody who may, maybe they heard something. You know, it's it's better to go, uh, you know, to, to the people that are personally, you know, have firsthand knowledge of it. Uh, second point, cultures are not uniform. Every culture contains different groups. They have their own reading and communication preferences. And another very good point, uh, he talks in here about age. Uh, so let's see, 18 to 21-year-old college students. Um, that's probably a different audience, no matter what the culture is, <laughs> you know, than uh, people that are in their, you know, 60s or 70s. And it's just, you can't just say, well, Japanese culture, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, there's too much diversity <laughs> within that uh, within that culture to make any sort of big, overwhelming claim. Uh, you always have to leave room for all these different groups and different ways of doing things. Uh, let's see, writing research questions. Uh, question one, do you use kind of genre in your culture? And so you could say, do you use resumes in your culture? And then if it's yes, you could go on to these questions. If it's no, then you could go on to these questions. Um, this is yeah, how to do research questions. Methods of data collection. He talks in here about interviews and case or interviews and focus groups. Now, I like this too. You know, so you could imagine this, uh, and I have my 332 students do this when they're applying for, uh, when they're doing their uh, job projects. You know, I really want them to talk to somebody who's doing the job that they would like to have, or who's a mem who's has a career in the field that they are interested in, uh, because you can really start to get some really valuable info. Again, you're not going to read it in a book. Uh, you, you might not even hear it in a lecture, uh, but it's really useful info that you, you can glean, and, and plus you're making a contact at the same time. Uh, but he gives some really good advice here. I really like this rule of threes idea. And so if, if you have one person tell you something, that's a personal opinion. If you uh, get the same response from two different people, that could just be a coincidence. Uh, if it's three or more people, though, it likely indicates a trend. You know, and at that point, you'd really want to start you know, taking that seriously. You know, so if you got three people that tell you, uh, we don't use resumes here, resumes aren't important, <laughs> you don't need a resume, uh, then you should probably uh, accept that, you know, go on to step number two. All right, focus groups. Uh, so these uh, are like, uh, I, I kind of think about them almost like a group of interviews, but or, I mean, a, a group interview. So instead of just having one person that you're talking to at a time, you might have a, a small group there. And there's different ways to, to do this, and there's issues with this. Yeah, the, the group thing. So sometimes, uh, you know, just like any group project, you know, sometimes people, certain people feel like they don't have uh, opportunities to speak their minds. They're just kind of dominated by, you know, one person. So you got sort of issues uh, with this one, too. Um uh, but the idea is it's it's quicker. You know, if you can talk to five people all at once, <laughs> you know, it would take you, uh, you know, imagine doing like one focus group of, for an hour with five people uh, versus doing uh, in separate interviews of like 10 minutes or, or whatever, you know, however that breaks down. Uh, this would give you a lot of information in a hurry. And then, of course, you could mix these methods together, do some interviews, do some focus groups. You could use Skype or group Skype or Zoom. <laughs> it's so easy to do this nowadays with Zoom. Uh, you know, it used to be such a difficult thing trying to have multiple people on a conference call. Uh, now it's just a snap. All right, so some final thoughts then. Writing in greater global contexts can be complex. It involves understanding the rhetorical expectations of other cultures and of groups within those cultures to craft message, messages that they can use to achieve an objective. The key is using methods to collect info, yes. 
of rhetorical and usability expectations directly from the members directly from the members of a cultural audience. Now, it's not always possible to do that, uh, but certainly to the extent that you can, especially in the drafting phases or the planning phases, say, oh, we're going to send this to, uh, you know, to India or to China. You know, don't you think it would be a good idea to, <laughs> you know, at least talk to some people from those cultures and, you know, figure out is this going to fly? Is this okay? Uh, you know, what do you think about these photos? Uh, is this too direct, too indirect? You know, is there anything you can you can help me with here? You know, anything like that will be extremely helpful. Okay, I think that's about everything for this lecture. Uh, so yeah, we'll stop it here. Uh, as always, if you have questions, I realize we're not going to cover everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge topic. You can take whole, whole courses on this. You can even major in it. You know, it's, it's you can get degrees in this, uh, on this topic. So don't don't feel bad if it's um, <laughs> you feel a little bit overwhelmed. <laughs> uh, but hopefully this is just kind of get get you started thinking about uh, these different cultural contexts and writing for a more global audience or tweeting or blogging or whatever the case may be. But I uh, hope you enjoyed this. If you've got comments, questions, love to hear those. You know, especially for those of you who've been to other countries or, you know, be, maybe, uh, you know, have firsthand experience with some of the stuff we're talking about here. Always love those, you know, and then I can include them as examples <laughs> in uh, future versions of this. So, so thanks again, but I will stop it here and see you again soon.